Christmas on the Planet Rygate podcast. Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the Planet Rygate podcast. Over this week and next week, we are going to go behind the scenes at Beauty and the Beast, the big top pantomime show in Red Hills Memorial Park. Now I'm recording this on the very last day of November and we actually do have some snow falling in the air. I'm standing outside the big top and about to make my way in. And you know what? I have been told that I am the very first person to be invited into the Big Top who's not a member of the crew or the staff of Rygate and Banstead Borough Council or anyone like that. I'm the first kind of non-official person. I'm the first member of the public. So this week and next week, you're going to meet some of the people who've helped put on the pantomime here at Red Hills Memorial Park. Some of the business people, but also the crew and the cast as well. Okay, now let's make my way up to the entrance because uh, there's a few people who have been booked to meet me. In the background, you may be able to hear the generator, which is running. So uh, I wonder if there's going to be a little bit of heat to be had here as well. And we're going into the big top panto entrance. Now, the entrance is just beside the Pavilion Cafe, which has reopened in the last few days. So you are able to get some hot drinks there. And of course, one of the great things is that the big top Memorial Park is just almost a stone's throw away from the Harlequin building itself. And meeting me here is Dwayne, who's Head of Leisure for Rygate and Banstead Borough Council. Good morning and welcome to the Big Top. Come on inside. We go through our outside doors. I appreciate this is the first time you will have seen the space. But welcome inside. And here we are coming in. And you know what, uh, Dwayne, my first thought is that this is a bit like the TARDIS, isn't it? It's so much bigger inside than outside. It is. It is a, it's a huge space. So you see it from the outside, 38 metres um, of, of big top. But as you walk inside, you realise actually just how big, how big it is. So you're kind of immediately dominating the space. On the left as you come in, 570 seats for our audience members. And on the right, the stage, uh, which is currently being worked on by our technical team to turn it into the big performance space that we need. And then to the left and the right, you've got the, you've got the sound, you've got the lighting guys. Our theatre technical team have done an incredible job. So over the last week, they've been operating inside here. They've now got their, their control box working. They've, um, they've been working at height, so they've been 12 metres high, uh, kind of right up at the top of the big tent, um, hanging lights. They've done an incredible job of turning this into a theatre rather than just a, an empty big top. Who knew that Rygate and Banstead Council had such expertise in putting up tents? Uh, would you be surprised if I said I did? <laughs> um, but actually, that was I mean, you like, don't. Do you? <laughs> you, 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 you've had no. to buy these um, people in. Yeah. yeah so, so the, the people are people. Uh, so the technical guys are, are the theatre's technical team. So, so they are the experts inside here. But the big top, absolutely, is a, is a thing that we, as an organisation, have never done. What is it usually used for? This big top. This big top is is hired in from a, a, an incredible company that we've been working with. It's, it was at Reading, I think, earlier in the year or, or at Leeds. So the, the company do big festivals. They tour around the world with uh, with big touring shows. Been used for a, a whole array of different things. So they know how to put it up in double quick time. And also, I know there's been quite a, a bit of talk. It's going going to be cold isn't it but actually over here I've got what are presumably great huge kind of heating duct in fact they are because I can I can feel the warmth coming through them these great long kind of uh, caterpillars which are blowing out hot air yeah we've had to overcome quite a lot of problems as you'll appreciate putting up a tent up in the park in the middle of winter heat was one of them so it is a heated tent so there's heating underneath the seating unit which will kind of keep the seating unit warm and the, uh, yeah the ducts that you're looking at there are two of five ducts that are blowing warm air into this space so of course once we get the cast in once we get the audience members in and the lights on there'll be warmth in here absolutely excellent I mean, you may still want to wear your coat or something, but you're not going to be shivering. Absolutely. This is, it's, not, it's not going to be a brick-built, warmed building, but it's not going to be cold. Yeah, excellent. OK. Remind us why we're doing this. Why this year is the first year that you're in a big top in Memorial Park rather than in the brick-built, purpose-built yeah. Harlequin Theatre right in the centre of town? Yeah, it's... it's uh 
probably a, a good place to say that this is nobody's plan A. This was not our intention this year. This is not a thing that we thought we would be doing. But at the end of September, we closed our building uh, for safety concerns after finding rack throughout the building. And really then the job for us was very much about how do we continue to deliver the Harlequin. So the Harlequin have been right at the heart of um, the borough, both in terms of its art and culture delivery, but also just dominating the kind of the town centre space since 1986. And we didn't want that to stop. So we've done several things to kind of keep keep the Harlequin alive. We've opened a pop-up shop in the Belfry with our, with our friends and colleagues from the Belfry there. But the big one for us was really about pantomime. Is there anything... Because it is a big draw, isn't it, oh. for, for, for the town, for the whole borough, for, for, yeah. for, for the Christmas period. In fact, it's probably your biggest thing of the year is it yeah it's certainly the biggest thing that we do ourselves yeah. you know it's it's a christmas tradition and you know our residents our families our visitors all of those people who come to this really the question for us was is there anything that we could do to, to do this we looked at some options we worked tirelessly with the team to look at what the art of the possible was and we settled here looking at how we could pop a big tent up into our incredible memorial park here in the heart of the town just meters away really from the theater itself and we've achieved it so you know as we stand here marks kind of seven weeks worth of planning and you know we've been inside the tent for just about a week. You told me earlier I'm one of the first people to be in here. And not only one of the first, the actual first, I think, yeah. I can't think of anybody that's been inside this top since we opened that's not connected to the, the delivery of it. Well, thank you for that. That's very kind of you to invite me in. It seems to me that you are on the edge of pulling triumph out of adversity. I mean, this has kind of fallen into your lap a certain extent, hasn't it? Because you do have the park. You were able to get the expertise. The parking for people who come here is going to be exactly the same exactly as it is for the, the logistics going to be exactly the same. There are other places in the country that wouldn't have been able to have coped with this kind of situation. I think that's, that's probably perfectly accurate. I think that we're very fortunate to have this park right in the middle of Red Hill. We're very, very proud of our green spaces across the borough generally. Memorial Park is, is one of those jewels in that in that incredible crown. Yeah, so we've been really lucky, but it's been a logistical challenge for us. In fact, I reckon that if I stood on top of the big top, I could probably see the Harlequin you, from, yeah. You can almost see it, absolutely. Not quite, but almost. It's definitely within very, very easy kind of accessible distance, yeah. Okay, well, let's let's, let's walk, let's across, walk the, across. across the front. Dwayne, there must be loads of people that you want to thank for helping you put on such a show. The list is is far too long, really, to kind of individually name. We start with my own theatre team. The, the planning and the organisation that the guys are, have put into this, the delivery of this, the work that is is a constant stream for them at the moment. But actually right across our, our wider council organisation, our colleagues in green spaces and in our health and safety team, in our food safety team, th th there's an endless number of people from across our own organisation and then of course there's the expertise that we've had to kind of bring in to kind of deliver it so yeah the, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and, and there must be a message to people in uh, Rygate and Red Hill and uh, further afield, yeah, Merstham and, and Hawley and Banstead in your borough, but also outside your borough as well, that this is the place to come for a really different pantomime experience this year. Completely. Big Top and Panto is not a thing that you often hear, um, so this is absolutely a, an experience not to be missed. It's quite unlike anything that we've ever done. It's quite unlike any panto that you will see anywhere else. We think we're the only Big Top panto in the country this year, so absolutely... OK, Dwayne, thanks very much My indeed. Pleasure. And uh, I can see the leader of Rygate and Banstead Borough Council, who is up here. In fact, I'm trying to see what row and what seat is in. I don't know whether he's bought these tickets. Number 32. <laughs> 32. Seat 32, yeah. Let me come and sit down beside you. So this is uh, Richard. Richard Biggs, as I say, leader of uh, Rygate and Banstead. This is all a bit different, isn't it, Richard? It's certainly different. It's the only one in the country and uh, hopefully a one-off. Take me back to that phone call, the email, the meeting, whatever it was, where you sat around and you said, OK, we know that there's the potential for rack this crumbly concrete to be in the Harlequin and then the penny dropped. Oh dear, what about the pantomime? What are we going to do? What was going through the minds of you and your team? Well, the first thing, obviously, was the safety of our staff in, in the Harlequin. So that decision was an easy decision to make. It's not safe at the moment. We don't take risk. Let's pull out of there, make sure that we can keep our staff safe. And then we had, what do we do with all the events that we've got booked and obviously the pantomime was the big one we'd got past the point of no return we needed to find a solution somehow there was a number of options we checked them all out and Dwayne brought this idea to us and we said let's go for it I'm intrigued to know what the other options were because this seems kind of so obvious but then good ideas always are obvious when you've come to that conclusion <laughs> yeah well one of them was obviously our local sports hall to see whether we could do something in there it wasn't practical it, it stopped us having 
that particular facility open for members of the public. And what we didn't want to do was stop other things to put something on. You're kind of moving the problem then, aren't you? That was all we were doing and and stopping sport instead of the theatre. And we didn't want to do that. And when Dwayne came with this idea, we thought, let's see. And originally we looked at potentially putting it in one of our car parks. uh, And then... Memorial Park was suggested and uh, we thought what a fantastic idea let's go for it. Someone said hold on a minute we've got a park which is only a stone's throw away from the Harlequin anyway. Absolutely and and all the facilities the car parking the local restaurants the bars the pubs are all there for people to go to before they come and see the panto in the big top. And what have people been saying about a panto in a big top because I'm guessing there may be some people that, that would say it's not going to be the same. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go this year. I want to be in a building. It's, it's, it's not traditional. And other people presumably are, are saying, oh, this is going to be a bit different. This is going to be exciting. Perhaps I haven't been for a few years, but I'm going to go to this. It could be the first. It could be the only. And, and that's the thing. It is unique. And I think people who love the Panto will try it. And I'm hoping they'll travel from far and wide to come and experience it. You can see from the space already that it's just going to be an amazing experience. And once it's full of people, once the actors are on the stage, it will just be a great experience for people. I'm looking forward to it. I'm here on the 9th, and I can't wait for my seat in the front to uh, watch the show. Do you know what your seat number is? Because I'm thinking of having a word with the guy so they can pick on you. No, they probably (laughs) will pick on me anyway. So that's pretty much guaranteed. Simon Bashford has done the Red Hill Panto for many, many years, and he's absolutely fantastic. So we're looking forward to seeing him as Dame Sherry Trifle, and it's going to be just a great event. Describe the scene that's in front of us. We're sitting in the in the auditorium on these uh, on these raised seats here. Paint a picture. The picture is very different to a week ago when I was here for the first time, when it was literally just some seats and a bit of staging. Now the lighting rigs have all gone up. The stage is being brought in. All the scenery is being brought in. We've got a different type of stage so that you can get round the back. Normally you go off at the sides. This one you can get round the back as well. There's no main curtain. So all the scenery changes are going to be viewed by the audience, but that's going to be part of the show. And then we're in raised seating. The big tent is all around us. At the moment, we've got beautiful lights flashing all over the place, big lighting rigs. And just to reassure people, the floor is is boarded up and there is heating and there's food and hot drinks outside. It's as good as it possibly can be, isn't it? Absolutely, and everything is is here for everybody. There's disabled access, there's space for wheelchairs, there's carpet going down at the front when it's all all ready, Uh, there's some more seating going in. It's a proper theatre in a big top. Oh, toilets, toilets. What about toilets? So toilets, we've got some luxury toilets coming into the park at the back and they will be available and there's also toilets for the actual crew as well. So. I, I think you've thought of everything. You've, you've, you've scuppered me. I, I like the idea of the scene changes happening in front of people because you can probably get away with that much more in a panto than you can perhaps a, 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 an Agatha Christie or something, can't you? Because it's part of the show and I'm sure there will be gags built into the pantomime which reference the fact that it's in the big top. I'm sure they will. Excellent. OK, Richard, thanks very much Thank indeed. You. Hope you enjoyed the show. Well, and now let's, uh, let's go. Now, I know there's a, uh, a pantomime expert who's been lined up to speak to us for the podcast. His name is Ian. So I think it's probably appropriate that I speak to Ian actually on the stage. So I'm going to make my way up this rather kind of steep ramp which has been put up the front of the stage for access and make my way I'm having a little look in the wings here, where all those huge metal crates are that they use to transport electrical equipment and lights and speakers and things around. And I'm having a, a little look around. I can see parts of the set which will be brought in. I'm going to be moving through the wings and see the back of the parts of the set. And now I'm actually on the stage where there's a fantastic board which says Beauty and the Beast. I'm literally in the spotlight, and Ian is here, who's our pantomime expert. Ian, thank you very much indeed for joining us. My pleasure. Good morning. Good morning. So, what makes you, sir, a pantomime expert? I've worked professionally in pantomime for well over 20 years, having previously worked in opera, 
and I always think going from opera to pantomime is was literally going from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> but I've worked in stage management in pantomime, and then for over 12 years I performed in pantomime regularly with Julian Cleary. We toured all over the country, and over those years I just developed a real interest in the history of pantomime, because it's a very peculiar form of entertainment when you think about it. And he's it. very British, oh, isn't he? Very, very I mean, British. other other countries probably think we're a bit mad mm. anyway, Absolutely. but you, 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 you give them um, beans on toast and pantomimes and they think we're even more weird. <laughs> yes, a pantomime, its origins were Italian back in the 15th, 16th century, but as it's developed today, it is essentially British. They really don't understand it anywhere else because it's all this audience participation. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, no, we don't. They don't have anything like that anywhere else, and they do find it a little bit strange. So it is very, very much a British tradition. And how original is it to have a pantomime in a big top? Have you ever heard of anything like this before? I've never heard of anything like this. This is, I think, unique. Pantomime and circus. I mean, circus is also a British invention, uh, though circus has spread around the world where pantomime hasn't. But here they are coming together, for, as far as I know, the first time ever. Circus has visited pantomime. Some pantomimes have been set in circuses, but as far as I know, this is the first time that a pantomime's ever been done in a big top, and I think it's fantastic. It is, isn't it? Now, as I say, we're standing beside a huge sign, glittery sign, with stars on it that says Beauty and the Beast. What do we know about Beauty and the Beast as far as the original fairy tale goes and moving, morphing into a pantomime? The Stories always change, don't they, from the inverted commas original to a pantomime setting? Most of our pantomimes are based on traditional fairy tales, and most of the pantomimes we use are French, because there's two main sources of fairy tales, not counting Hans Anderson, because he's more recent. But you get Brothers Grimm, Grimm's fairy tales, and then they were Germanic, is that they right? were German, yeah. and then you get Charles Perrault, who was French, and he wrote Sleeping Beauty, he wrote a version of Cinderella, and he also wrote Beauty and the Beast. And when you say he wrote, was he taking those from original fairy tales? Most, and, yeah. yeah, most of them are original, traditional fairy tales. He, he pulled different threads pulled together. Different, yeah. He would get people to tell him traditional fairy tales that they knew, and he would collect them. A few he invented, mm. but most of them were traditional fairy tales that everybody knew. I mean, like the story of Cinderella is over a thousand years old. Beauty and the Beast, I think, is more recent than that. But, but also, I guess, putting in much more of a, uh, a story arc, perhaps, and, and embellishing and, and, and having the, the hero to win at the end and all those kind of tricks to keep people intrigued as they were listening to a story as they would have been back in the day rather than reading it. As you say, back in the day, people, most people couldn't read or write. It was only the upper educated people. But most fairy tales were passed on by word of mouth. And so when you get someone like Perrault or the Brothers Grimm, they would write them down. And they would, you're quite right, they would embellish them in their own way to make them gripping for people to read. They always wanted to know how the heroine escaped the danger that she was in, particularly with Beauty and the Beast is one of those, and who gets rewarded at the end and who gets punished, because pantomimes and fairy tales always have the same moral. The goody wins the and the baddie loses. The wins and the baddie gets yeah. punished, yes. And for a pantomime, of course, that's fantastic, isn't it? Because you've got all those opportunities for booing and hissing and applauding and cheering. All that came from music hall. That tradition of audience participation comes from the second half of the 19th century when music hall artists, because music was really rowdy and raucous. People would shout and shout at the stage. and the Perhaps artists, even throw things. Oh, you'd, yeah, if they didn't like the artists, they'd throw <laughs> rotten tomatoes at them. And you'd get off. And they, all that kind of stuff would, was, came from music hall. So we owe an awful lot of pantomime tradition to music hall and people like Dan Lino. So all this repartee between the stage and the audience is purely British. and say so you don't get it anywhere else. And it all comes from Victorian music hall. Now, this is the first time you've been on the stage here in the big top. Uh, what do you actually make of it, looking out there at the potential audience, at that bank of blue seats, looking here at the stage itself and some of the, some of the staging and some of the effects? What's your impression? Considering where we are, it's amazingly, to a large degree, like standing on any theatre stage. You look down, you've got a stage. Behind us, we've got scenery. In front of us, we've got the audience. Of course, it's only when you look up standing here but it's in a totally different environment because we've got this amazing tent in front of us or above us can i come and be in the pantomime this year i think it'd be lovely to appear in front of an audience like this in this space because it's quite quite unique i've not been on a stage like this before it's 
really quite thrilling. And what do you make of the fact that the scene changes are going to be in front of the audience? There's no curtain to drop or anything like that. That's going to make a little bit of a difference. It kind of shows a bit of light in on magic, but then pantomime does that anyway, doesn't it? The thing about scene changes is usually there are lots and lots of them. And as one, when it used to stage manage pantomimes, you know, the scene changes come thick and fast. I'm going to be very excited to see how they actually do the scene changes. So I can't wait to come and see the show. Uh, I mean, they're going to have to make reference to it, aren't they? going to be, yeah, because... And you can do that in a panto. But you can't fly anything up and down. I mean, normally, in, oh, yeah. you know, you have curtains that come in and scene changes take place behind. We can't do that on this space, so... I'm really excited to see how they're actually going to do the scene changes because it will be very different. It's going to be totally unique, this experience, because, I say, pantomime, as far as I know, has never been done in a tent like this before. So it's going to be fantastic. OK, all right, Ian, thank you very much indeed for your expertise and your insight there. So we'll leave it for this week's edition of the Planet Rygate podcast, speaking to people who've been explaining the background to how we got to be in a big top in Memorial Park rather than the Bricks and Mortar Harlequin Theatre right in the town centre of Red Hill. Next week on the programme, we'll go behind the scenes and speak to some of the cast and crew of Beauty and the Beast at the Memorial Park in the Big Top. This is Peter Stewart. Thank you for listening to the Planet Rygate podcast.